God today is more than a space for the continuing extension of art into the expanded field that we've heard about already and post-conceptual modes of practice. It is rather the renewed site of the debate on capitalist temporality and reproduction, history and time. Indeed, it is the double articulated character of the avant-garde. On the one hand, its revolutionary function as that which presses beyond or in advance of the present, which we've heard about already. And on the other, its role as the revolutionary critic of the modernizing present and modernity. The, and this makes it crucial, both these aspects makes it crucial to the debate on art, emancipation and temporality today. In the following, therefore, I want to look at how a defence of the avant-garde in art enables another kind of thinking on modernity. This, this paper will essentially be about art and modernity. And is one not beholden <coughs> to the abstract universality and temporal compression <coughs> of the value form. And therefore, one not subordinate to the unilinearity of capitalist developmentalism. In this sense, to understand the continuing revolutionary value and valence of the avant-garde, we need to look again at its defining relationship with anti-historicism and the critique of the philosophy of history. For it is here that the problems and dilemmas of contemporary culture will be foregrounded, inasmuch as it is the ways in which artists and theorists are able to think the relationship between past, present and future as an anti-historicist relation of non-relation, which will become clearer as I go along, that will determine a workable politics in art. Okay, now this section is entitled Begriff Geschichte and Anti-Historicism. Uh, I'll come to uh, my definition of Begriff Geschichte in a moment. Firstly, historicism. Historicism derived from positivistic historiography and the evolutionary and developmental models and schemas of the bourgeois social sciences and what remains of social democratic progressivism has two key components. An assumption that history unfolds on the basis of the incremental development of the achievements of the past and the notion that the past is freed from the present in order to render the present transformable into the future. This is underwritten in positivism proper by three autonomizing definitions of the social subject that in a sense provide the machinery for a working ideology of change and developmentalism. Namely, a subject whose self-possessive identity is divorced from the divisions of subjectivity, which, have, which we've heard about already this morning in Mark's paper. A subject whose relationship to the world is based on the simple instrumental reorganization of an external world, and a subject whose agency transcends the causal efficacy of social relations. Now, of course, the critique of this intellectual apparatus or capitalist discourse, as Jacques Lacan once called it, continues to define the long emancipatory struggle in thought derived from Freud and Marx in the modern period in which the autonomous subject has been destroyed again and again in theory over the last 150 years. But theory as practice has its limits. Indeed, what is assumed to be destroyed in theory finds itself in turn destroyed as practice. In other words, under the abstract universality of the commodity form, the logical relations that support capitalist social reality continue to reproduce themselves irrespective of the intellectual or ideological critique of those relations. This is the ontological irrealism, not realism, but irrealism of capitalist discourse. The fact that 
the abstract universality of the commodity form is not imposed on everyday relations and appearances, so to speak, but structures the real as the result of commodity exchange. One of the reasons that Lacan talks, therefore, about historicism and positivism as the socio-subjective props of capitalist discourse is that their function precisely is to act in the interests of this social continuum. The attack on historicism then over the last 40 years has operated on two fronts simultaneously. The historicization of the subject as a condition of the critique of the autonomy of the subject, of the strong ego, and in a comparable temporal move, the returning of the contemporaneous to the non-contemporaneous and the non-contemporaneous to the contemporaneous as a condition of breaking free of the present as the unfolding gateway to the future. So this is, so this is essentially going to be my um, uh, premise. That the, that the um, avant-garde plays a crucial part in the critique of this notion that the present is an unfolding gateway to the future. Thus, in psychoanalytic terms, if the autonomous subject refuses the reality of castration, in the theory of history, the release of the past from the present in order to render the present transformable into the future separates past and present from the multiplicities of historical time. This is why certainly since the reception of uh, Walter Benjamin in Europe and North America since the 1970s, the overwhelming role of anti-historicism in historical materialism has been to link the experience of the non-contemporaneous in the contemporaneous to a multi-causal account of historical change and the asynchronic conditions of development, and therefore to the transformative pull or explosive charge of the multi-temporal valency of the past in the present. So the past comes to affect the present in these terms. In these terms, anti-historicism is expressly a critique of sufficient reason. The past does not explain the nature of the present, and therefore presupposes the future is the evolutionary or rational consequence of the present, but on the contrary inhabits and negates the present as the transformative condition of the present's non-identitary relationship to itself and to the past. So the present has a non-identity relationship to itself, as does the past. History, therefore, is not the domain of achieved facts subject to interpretation, but of retroactively achieved concepts. And we've heard about retroaction this morning as well. This is why the notion of Begriffgeschichte, or conceptual history, has been one of the key critical building blocks of an anti-historicist temporality and historical practice since Benjamin. For under its interventionist logic, the reconstruction and re-reception of the historical event is wrenched from its settled historicist place within chronological time, displacing the self-sufficiency of both facts and interpretation. And in some sense that is um, very Lacanian as well. Accordingly, this has had enormous implications for understanding the avant-garde, whose repeated historicist foreclosure since the 1970s has been based on the assumption that its meanings and agency have been superseded by the present and therefore claims for its extension are merely a formalist or stylistic repetition of its origins. This is a crucial point, for historicists don't deny that past events might speak to the present, but they do reject that they have any causal efficacy. Whatever we might reclaim from the past is confined to the past. Interpretations do not generate agency. Begriffgeschichte, 
conceptual history, in contrast, treats interpretive intervention into the past as an actively prospective move, insofar as the truth of the event establishes itself through the process of intervention, changing past and present as a consequence. Indeed, until the intervention is made, we are not able to see the event at, at all, or see its continuing significance in the same way. So, events quite simply disappear until this process of intervention is actually, is actually made. Thus, Begriffgeschichte is not just the work of recovery or redemption of reclaiming the past from the dead hand of condescension, of recovering the overlooked, but of the conceptual production of the event in the present as an intervention into the present. In other words, Begriffgeschichte is precisely form-giving insofar as the event in the process of its historicization is conceptually reconfigured and therefore epistemologically indivisible from the process of intervention itself. But this, and this is the important point, but this is not a speculative process. For the event to have efficacy in the present, the truth claims of the event must possess a non-contemporaneous, contemporaneous capacity to shape the present and open up a space for future praxis. The event can only be reconstructed from that which has determinate historical efficacy. It cannot be rebuilt on supposition alone. But in turn, crucially, the process of intervention is itself conceptually mediated. There are no pure or non-historically determined returns or interventions from the present, so to speak, insofar as the point from which the return is made is also exercises a privileged perspective on the past. So, for example, the refunctioning of the avant-garde today is only possible through the political reception of the post-revolutionary and post-Thermidorian history of its original destruction and reception. There is therefore no non-traumatic recovery of its critical horizons, no neutral recovery of the avant-garde as such. So, to underline my pointing, um, I mean, all the work that Mark has been doing himself on the would-be recovery of the avant-garde is not, is not devised as a neutral redemption of various aspects, techniques, and so forth, of the original avant-garde. Rather, it's an intervention into the space of the avant-garde in order to refunction it for the present based on both the problems and issues that the present set for the historic avant-garde, but also on the fact that the original avant-garde was produced in a revolutionary space that no longer exists. And this is what I mean by the impossibility of a non-traumatic recovery of the avant-garde. So we have to take account of the fact that our history of the avant-garde is based also upon its destruction in the, in the, in the 1930s. Now that, in turn, that's open to debate. I mean, there are, you know, there are many defenders of the avant-garde who say that we don't have to accept that traumatic history and that we can, we can act voluntaristically or in, a, in a vitalist manner without having to acknowledge the trauma of that history. But that's, that's a, a, a debate for, for later. I, in fact, don't, don't agree with that. Okay, hence, what we make from the revolutionary truth claims of the avant-garde is made from the truth of this post-Thermidorian history. They are inseparable. Consequently, if the avant-garde 
is irreducible to its origins, that is, if the conceptually produced avant-garde is supplementary to the originary event, this irreducibility is mediated by its historical conditions and possibility. But essentially we're talking about the, the, the possibility or the impossibility of the avant-garde today. Or rather, to put it another way, the avant-garde's condition, conditions of emergence are determined by its suspensive and, conting and contingent um, conditions of possibility. So to reiterate my earlier point at the beginning of the paper, we can't, we can't simply um, re reclaim the past without acknowledging these historical constraints. Thus, there's a fundamental dialectical understanding of the afterlife of the original avant-garde at play here, derived from the asynchronic and non-contemporaneous con contem contem contemporaneous conditions of Begriff Geschichte as method. Under changed social, economic and political circumstances, the would-be core programme of the avant-garde undergoes a process of transformation and qualification subject to these changed circumstances. Thus, after the Second World War, the entry of the ideals and horizons of the avant-garde into post-revolutionary or post-Thermidorian space radically alters what might or might not be advanced in the name of these ideals and horizons. Accordingly, what is produced and named by the avant-garde in this period, so we're talking about you know, mid to late 1950s through to the, um, to the early 1970s, So accordingly, what is produced and named by the avant-garde in this period as key avant-garde aims and strategies, that is, the dissolution of art into life, the deconstruction of the monadic artist, the distribution of artistic skills into production uh, and across social classes, the extension of artistic form beyond painting and sculpture, are subject to multiple extensions, refunctioning and repositionings that dissolve any sense of this work as an extension of an unchanged core. This is why the avant-garde is not reclaimed or rediscovered in this period. It is refunctioned in response to and in resistance to the prevailing post-revolutionary and late Cold War conditions. Fundamentally then, the political claims of the research programs of the original avant-garde change as a result of the gap between what the avant-garde originally named as a revolutionary sequence or hoped to name and the radically constrained conditions of this process of nomination in the post-war world. As such, the avant-garde's refunctioning of its programme is itself the outcome of the new social ontology of art in this period. Namely, the assimilation of art into the new cultural industries and the growing calendrical pressures of the art market and the pursuit of renewable novelty. The post-war avant-garde, of course, draws off this dynamic. One should not forget this. But nevertheless, the determining logic of the avant-garde's critique of modernity its revolutionary production of places and spaces and forms of agency beyond the modernist canon is subject to a striking compression. Artists in this period still operate in response to these ambitions. Think of Wolf Ostell and Robert Smithson's extraordinary extra gallery projects in the late 1960s, but there is no direct relationship between art, cultural form, and the transformation of the sensible. No alignment between art, the collective subject, general social technique, and the environment. And in turn, no refunctioning of the technical and social division of labour under the non-instrumental demands of art. So the point I'm making here is that in this, in this period, um, despite the, the refunctioning of the avant-garde under the name of the neo-avant-garde, neo the majority, um, I, I would say, all the advanced art of this period is still operating within 
the, canonic, the canonical terms of modernist practice. So this is a neo-avant-garde operating within modernist practice and history, given the dominance of the American art market through the 1950s, 60s, and, uh, and 70s. So there's, rather, so rather, there, there's a, a fragmented interpolation of the avant-garde horizon within the mediating realm of a newly expanding art world. We have to remember also that this, this is, we talk about the expansion of the art world today, but this is also um, the, the first tr truly global expansion of the art world after the Second World War. This, of course, is the great period of public um, uh, gallery building, museum building throughout Europe, particularly in Germany and France and in North America. Of course, all, all the museums that we know or love or hate uh, in North America today were built during this period, in a sense to house and process and support this neo avant work. Thus, the avant-garde sphere of intervention and influence retains a twofold identity in this period. Firstly, it foregrounds the socially delimited character of the new institutions. That is, although, although these new institutions are committed to new avant-garde practice, they have a very limited sense of the, of the social function of art. And secondly, defends a critique of the uh, of the quasi um, amnesical identity of the prevailing return to modernist uh, painting, the canon, and the monadic artist. Admittedly, both of these strategies are little more than small scale counter moves in lieu of the weight of their historic avant garde precedents. Yet, nevertheless, they remain profoundly enabling in terms of how art in the present continues to retain its links with the past. So, although um, my, my, there's, an, there's an implicit critique here in my position about the socially constrained nature of these new institutions of art, nevertheless, this is an extraordinary, extraordinarily profound moment in the unfolding of the history of the new art of God, insofar as this generation of artists from the late 50s onwards makes a reconnection with the historic, the, the historic avant-garde. And we see this through from new realism in Europe and to a lesser extent in America, you know, onto happenings, fluxus, minimalism, land art, and so on and so on. Now the avant-garde, or rather more precisely the neo-avant-garde in this period, as I said from 1950s onwards, then operates accordingly in response to a temporality not derived from the ev evolutionary or linear continuity of the modernist painterly canon. That is, irrespective of the neo-avant-garde assimilation into the new institutions of art, and the international circuits of production and reception, and the pluralizing historical framework of the new modernism and later postmodernism, its claims to extend the claims of the historic avant garde act as an asymmetrical rupture and disaffirmative presence within this new regime. By this I mean that even though much neo avant garde uh, practice is historicized as radically extending the great tradition of modernist accomplishment, its motive force remains attached to the unassimilable rupture of the historical uh, avant-garde with bourgeois culture. Irrespective of this motive force's weak or attenuated presence in actual works and in internal to the social relations of artists during this period. How are we doing for time? Are we? Uh, ten, minutes. ten minutes? Oh, we're not going to get through this. Um, okay. Well, I mean, okay. I mean, I, I don't want to use up all, all, all the time. Um, um, this is why Peter's Ber Peter Berger's Theory de Avant Garde, published in 1974 and then translated into English 
in 1984, muddies the water historically and historiographically by adopting a version of revolutionary historicism rather than revolutionary begrifka shikta in his assessment of the post-war avant-garde. Now, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Peter Berger's um, theory of the avant-garde. I mean, it's, it's the canonic text on the historic avant-garde and the new avant-garde. Um, it still has great value today, irrespective of all the um, criticisms of it, inclu including my own. If you haven't read it, either in German or English, I would suggest that you, that you do so if you want to pursue your you know, further research on the question of the avant-garde and the avant -garde. Okay, that is, he fa that is, Berger fails to think the avant-garde beyond its unfinished conditions of reduction, reducing the neo-avant-garde, because remember he's writing at the high point of the neo-avant-garde, that is, he fails to think the avant-garde beyond um, its conditions of reduction, reducing the neo-avant-garde to a failed echo of its heroic early years. The consequences of this are twofold. The essentialization of the revolutionary content or core program of the avant-garde, separate from its unfolding historical production, repositioning and refunctioning, and its re repositioning and refunctioning, and the blurring of the fundamental temporalizing difference between the avant-garde and modernism as such. That is, the avant-garde, as it is defined and theorized in the early Soviet Union, Berlin and in Paris under surrealism is not the heightened and incantatory subordination of art and the social world to a process of modernization, but precisely its opposite, the freeing of social creativity, artistic form and artistic identity from the calendrical turnover of the commodity and the valorization of the monadic self or strong ego. In this sense, between 1917 and 1927, the avant-garde breaks through the process of capital modernization to identify an alternate kind of modernity in which the production of the new shifts horizontally, that is, through the critique of artistic labor, artistic form, and the art institution, there is a move externally towards a new collective culture. Now, of course, Art's relationship to technological modernization and capitalism plays a crucial part in this. Constructivism and productivism derive their momentum and idealism from what art and the artist might make of the advanced relations of production. In this sense, there is no avant-garde research programs without the interface between technique, technology, and the advanced relations of cultural production. Yet even in the writing of the most partisan and, technologi and technologicist adherents of the machino technical transformation of art in the 1920s, the fundamental struggle was always to produce a new subjectivity in art, in labor, in labor as art, in art as labor, not beholden to the calendrical order of the commodity form. In this sense then, as the avant-garde passes through the fires of modernity as its critic and its celebrant, it, as it does this, the anti-technological anti defenders of modernist aestheticism, concerned with the imagined freedoms of contemplation and sensuous form, principally painting, these are the willing and indeed ardent accomplices of art's commodified exchange. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm, not gonna be, I'm not gonna be able to, to read all this. I'm going to now um, praise some of the arguments. I'm gonna read some bits and then move on to my final um, thoughts and, and conclusion. Okay, I'm gonna move back now to my early discussions on the temporality of the avant-garde and the philosophy of history. Um, and the, this interface between the contemporary and the non-contemporary, which is absolutely crucial to our contemporary understanding of the avant-garde. Thus, 
even at the heart of the new commodified conditions of artistic production in the post-war world, the neo-avant-garde as a revenant or residual avant-garde retains this temporal link to the historic avant-garde critique of modernity. There may have been no stable and progressive links between art and transformative forces from below, but nevertheless, as a placeholder for other ways of doing and being, or other ways of organizing creativity outside of the market, the attenuated conditions of avant-garde production and reception played the role in Ernst Bloch's sense of the non-contemporaneous contemporary. This means, ontologically therefore, that the avant-garde is, is not to be confused with those forms of historicism, like Burgers and others since, that would identify the avant-garde either with a failed event or with a past set of stylistic resources that are now freely available for semiotic or symbolic recovery. On the contrary, in the prevailing post-Thermidorian space that we still live and work in, the atemporality of the avant-garde as a research program represents an important stake in that range of social political experiments that Alain Badieu has identified with, and I quote, another order of time. And I quote again, a different durée to that imposed by the law of the world, end of quote. This means that the avant-garde has a special part to play in a new politics of time, particularly in the light of the growing crisis of capitalist reproduction and the overwhelming comprehensive and, claustro and claustrophobic character of the permanent now of the new network, culture, and its variously thinned out and virtual solidarities. Now I'm going to... move on towards the end. Return to this conce uh, concept of uh, the Griffgeschichte. I can't actually talk about um, its um, its I can't talk about its historical production as a concept because I don't have any time. But anyway, I'll I'll, I'll run through I th I'll run through some of the uh, the questions that uh, subtend it. In these terms, um, we might talk about the avant-garde today as the new old, retroactively positioned as the old new. Obviously, the historic avant-garde no longer exists or is able to exist in its specific Soviet, German, and Parisian forms. There are no futurist returns here as a pure redemption of the past. Consequently, if the present is in constellational tension with the past as mediated potential, and as such, the present's openness to the future is retroactively formed out of the determining conditions of the past in the present, as we discussed at the beginning, then the revolutionary potential of the avant-garde is ontologically grounded in two ways. It is irreducible to its original conditions of production. That is, the avant-garde is supplementary to the avant-garde, you know, historically as we have asserted, but also in a converse move, its, poten its potentiality is irreducible to the notion that the present is freely available as an act of pure creativity. In other words, the original avant-garde, in a sense, did not exist in a given finite form. That is, was not ever self-present to itself. When it was produced as a category in the process of its conflictual emergence. Nevertheless, the labor of Begriffgeschichte as the Hegelian labor of the avant-garde's futurist historicization cannot substitute the refunctioning of its potentiality for that inherited historical absence. To do so, of course, is to enact precisely that abstract exercise of the historical will 
that but you warns us about in being an event and all and that tends to always haunt the edges of anti-historicism okay now on to my um, concluding remarks so the refunctioning of the avant-garde. This is essentially what I've been talking about, and in some sense, uh, Mark has been addressing uh, in his, his comments this morning. The refunctioning of the avant-garde today represents an extraordinary uh, disordering of the intellectual, cultural, and economic machinery that holds conventional forms of commodity exchange and the art market in place. That is, with the exponential rise of temporal, participatory, and a disciplinary research-based activities produced largely outside the primary market of private galleries and major museums, the refunctioned avant-garde provides a very different set of social relations, spatial conditions, and subjective identifications, usually associated with the production of artistic dry goods for this primary market. This is not to say that this kind of work does not inhabit commodity culture, or operate within the market for intellectual goods, or requires approbation at some level from governing institutions, or is engaged in sales. Art under capitalism is art under capitalism, irrespective of the dissident and self-negating forms it adopts. There are no pure exit points from commodity relations, and consequently, much of the work, you know, the work today continues to operate inside what we know as the art world. Yet the forms of labour, the modes of non-aesthetic engagement and research intensive strategies developed in this art produces various modes of disinvestment from the primary market that stand athwart or in non-compliance with the primary market and its rigid conflation of consumable artistic form and individualised artistic identity. The rise of the artist group or collective globally, the reliance on, non, on, on networked forms of exchange, the incorporation of non-instrumental extra-artistic research into artistic practice, and the temporal character of much of the work produces a determinate swerve or even break in the means and ends of artistic subjectivity, and therefore how artists define their labour and artistic identity. Consequently, the production of the new is lodged in a transformative, even revolutionary encounter with the situation and condition of art as idea, rather than with the market's veneration of generic difference centred invariably on medium specificity. Indeed, research, artistic practice, artistic form and artistic subjectivity form a shifting constellational framework within a larger extra-artistic research framework that mediates this encounter with the means and ends of art, namely art's place within the totalizing critique of capitalism. I think this is, I think this is, the, this is the fundamental shift, I think, that, that, that operates now within a refunctioned avant-garde. This idea that, that art can or might part participate within the totalizing critique of capitalism. Of course, the totalizing critique of, of capitalism was implicit at some level in the neo-avant-garde, post the 1950s in the US and Europe, but it never took on um, the explicit forms that it takes on today, particularly in relation to the questions of value and the value form. And I think that, that is, that's, that's important. So the politics of this work, therefore, and there's a lot of work to choose from globally, enormous amount, as we all know, you know Rex Media Collective in India, Future Farmers in the USA, Stodart in Russia, rests not simply on manifest critiques of political iniquities or inequalities, but on the space and time of artistic provision as points of negation with the temporal compression of production and experience under the commodity form. That is, the opening out of practice to a temporally extended and centrifugal non-instrumentalized research model which creates a non-calendrical encounter with the new that is at odds with the narrative of the modern and modernization. That's another fundamental shift, I think, that um, 
in the in, in the uh, in the enabling of the new today, there's also uh, an explicit critique of the modern and modernisation, which, in uh, as I'll come to in a moment, is not in, is not in fact um, a, a paradox. Okay. Um, Okay, so this then in turn pushes what artists do into direct confrontation with the market's limited account of artistic uh, change and creativity. In other words, such work establishes a non-compliant and non-identitary set of relations with commodity relations, in which the collective exchange of skills and affects and the production of knowledge overflow the fixed form of the art object and its exchange value. And this is crucial for any sense of the avant-garde as a research program. For these forms of free exchange establish an important centrifugal dynamic for art in the present period, namely the development of an art after art in the expanded field, in which the collective forms of participatory production and reception become constitutive of art's open-ended research interests. We might call this reflective process then a split within the time as measure of the commodity form, in which the drive to instrumentalize and entrepreneurialize as an expression of the individual creativity associated with the reduction of artistic dry goods for the primary market are suspended. Thus, by acting collaboratively or collectively in order to establish a thinking community or alternatively in order to produce a transformation of a given state of affairs based on work with a group of individuals in a given locale, such models, at least when they are successful, and maybe that's something that we can also talk about, are out of joint with the heteronymous conditions of commodity production from which they emerge. And thus the value of such artworks lies in their autonomy as actions or interventions. And this is essentially, um, this is, I mean, this is crucial to my philosophical perspective here and uh, for much of my other writing on these questions. So irrespective of their actual political efficacy or transformative uh, um, 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 outcomes, this work um, um, enters what we call a different register of achievement. For in the end, the value of these works lies in their capacity to engage in non-instrumentalized forms of learning and exchange, which in turn may lead to other non-instrumentalized forms of engagement and exchange. So we might say that actually this, this exhibition and this, this seminar is precisely that. That is, is it engaged, hopefully, in, in non-instrumentalized forms of exchange uh, and, uh, and engagement and, and learning. Thus, the claims for the new in art here stand to be made realizable in advance of capitalism, not simply in advance of art. This is the other, I think, big shift in the contemporary refunctioning of art. Artists today are not terribly interested in producing art that's in advance of what stands for so-called advance in art. What they're interested in, 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 in art's position in relation to some notion of advance beyond capitalism. And consequently, there is an atemporal, temporal order at play here that traverses both the logic of the value form and artistic futurism, and that connects the refunctioned avant-garde um, of today with, its, with the historic avant-garde, even though this refunctioned avant-garde is limited in its transformative reach, that it exists in a suspensive state, as I put it you know, elsewhere. That is, the generalized shift to participatory and collaborative and adisciplinary research intensive practice today represents a quite extraordinary collective negation of capitalist culture in this epoch of capitalist stagnation or neoliberal uh, non-reproduction and therefore invites the consideration 
in its various and inventive rejections of time as measure and the introduction of a gift culture, the central part art might play in the transformation of the relationship between free labour and productive labour in a post-capitalist world. And this is why the anti-historicist avant-garde is so significant in defining the question of temporality and, and futurity. In its manifestation of the old new in the new old, the refunctioned avant-garde provides a working space for experimentation and exchange that is both in time and out of time, both contemporary and non-contemporary. Consequently, the newest in the oldest, and that's a, a gloss on, on Marx there, is not the reinsertion of the old into the new, but the first move in the post-historicist opening up of the past in the present to the future. Thank you. So we got there.